The Lord of the Rings is filled with heroes, shining examples of courage, fortitude, and perseverance in the face of incomprehensible evil and overwhelming odds. Most of these exemplary characters are warriors of surpassing skill who bravely stare down the hordes of Mordor and Isengard and emerge victorious. Aragorn, Theoden, Eomer, Eowyn, Legolas, Gimli, the list goes on and on. And yet, the chief heroes of this incredible saga are two hobbits. Two shire folk who love beer, pipeweed, and an unconscionable amount of food. Two halflings for whom leaving their homes to walk across the entirety of Middle-earth and right to the very cracks of doom would seem not only impossible, but just as much a fantasy story as it is to us. And between these two hobbits, well, we all love Frodo. He accepted the impossible task thrust upon him and took it as far as anyone could, but Frodo wouldn't have got far without Sam. Without his steadfast companion and loyal gardener and servant. Yes, Sam is Frodo's servant. Another point that sets him apart from the royal likes of Aragorn, Faomir, and Theoden. Even among hobbits, Sam is hardly famous or notable. He lives with his father and works with his hands, tending to the lawn and gardens at Bag End. It's a life that modern society would largely look down on. Our culture, at least in the West, is obsessed with individuality, self-sufficiency, and being one's own master. We tend to think that we are the main character in our stories, and why should the story's hero have to bow to the will of another? Well, Sam knows that he is not the hero of his story. He doesn't dream of personal wealth or glory. To be sure, Sam's mind does wander beyond the Shire to the elves, the tree people, and other such wonderful things, but because he sees beauty and goodness in them, not even because he wants to experience the wider world. Sam loves the Shire, this peaceful, idyllic home that is the only one he's ever known, to the point that he doesn't really trust anyone without the good sense to live in Hobbiton. Indeed, the only thing that could tear him away from his beloved home is his loyalty to Frodo. And while the movies largely do Sam justice, and Gandalf pulling the eavesdropping hobbit up through the window of Bag End is lifted straight from the pages of the book, Tolkien's work really emphasizes how steadfastly loyal Sam is, as he conspires with Merry, Pippin, and Fatty Bulger to keep an eye on Frodo's doings and uncover all of his and Gandalf's secret plans so as to not let Frodo flee the Shire all on his own. Leave him, I said. I never meant to. I am going with him if he climbs to the moon, and if any of those black riders try to stop him, they'll have Sam Gamgee to reckon with. This single-hearted devotion of Sam to Frodo is truly remarkable. It is essential to his character. It's what makes Sam, Sam. Think about that. This most beloved character, from arguably the most beloved novels and movies of all time, exists in that story to serve someone else. Sam knows his role. He knows who he is. Not perfectly, though. If Sam has a vice, it's being overly humble to the point of self-degradation and serving others to the point that he doesn't reserve any care for his own well-being. Sam also, well, isn't known to be the smartest or most capable. Sam is known to his friends, and even to himself, as clumsy and plain, maybe even dull, or worse if you catch him at a bad time. His friends love him, and Sam certainly takes pride in the skills that he does have, but he doesn't exactly have a high view of himself. Moments like these help humanize Sam and set him apart from the noble paragons who are superbly intelligent and skilled with the blade, masters on horseback, or wise beyond human ken. Again, all those characters are wonderful in their own right, but Sam being so much closer to our own level of intelligence and proficiency, I mean, I'm assuming few if any of you are master swordsmen or tacticians, helps him to be more relatable, to show that his level of virtue is attainable even for us simple, ordinary folk. And Sam has virtue in spades. He demonstrates bravery and prudence by standing up to Strider, this mysterious stranger asking the hobbits to trust him practically sight unseen. As usual, the book fleshes out this conversation more than is allowed in the movie. I love that Strider addresses Sam directly and acknowledges his role as Frodo's protector. Almost immediately upon meeting Sam, Aragorn identifies the hobbit's greatest asset, his uncompromising love for Frodo, and his willingness to sacrifice his own well-being for his masters. And if I may pick another bone with the movie, 
On Weathertop, it is actually Sam who is the most cautious of the hobbits, and doesn't love the idea of starting a fire atop a hill, even if they are in a dell. I did smell a fire. Are you out of your mind? Oh, we're in a dell. Sam may not know what Aragorn does about the Black Riders, but he certainly knows how light works. So, obviously, he would not be so stupid as to light a fire unprompted while being hunted by servants of Sauron. It's worth noting that in this passage, Sam may disagree with Aragorn, but he doesn't refuse him. This is a key point in humility. We may know, or think we know, a great deal about a given subject or even our own area of expertise, but sometimes, someone comes along who has been around the block a few more times than we have, and if you trust them, you listen to them, even if their advice runs contrary to your instincts. In other words, to be humble, you have to know the limits of your abilities and knowledge, and if you ask me, it is far better to underestimate them than to overestimate them. Case in point, when Frodo disappears near Amon Hen and the Fellowship is searching for him, Sam attempts to keep up with Aragorn and Baromir as they run through the woods, but soon he falls behind. His hobbit physique simply can't keep up with the men as they cover as much ground as possible in order to find the Ringbearer. So, what does Sam do? He doesn't try to push himself beyond his limits. He instead relies on his familiarity with Frodo, who is closer to him than to anyone else, to determine Frodo's likeliest course of action. This brings us to one of the most poignant and meaningful scenes in the trilogy, as we witness the full display of Sam's dedication to Frodo, but also Frodo's love for Sam. See, it's certainly wonderful to serve, to give of yourself, but there is the possibility, perhaps even the probability in today's self-centered world, that you might not receive the same selfless, unconditional love in return. When looking at their relationship from a surface-level view, Frodo does not do for Sam what Sam does for Frodo. Sam appears to give and give, and Frodo just goes along. That's the nature of the quest, though. Frodo is the one to whom the ring was entrusted, and Frodo was entrusted to Sam. Their relationship does not need to be a completely equitable two-way street. They each have their own purpose, and both hobbits are steadfast and unwavering in them. What this scene highlights, then, that isn't always obvious, is how much Frodo cares about Sam. No doubt, Frodo wishes he could have Aragorn, Gimli, and the rest with him, but the protection they would provide wouldn't counterbalance the detriment of traveling with too many companions who can't match hobbits for stealth, and, mighty though they might be, can't fight the entire forces of Mordor. But surely one more hobbit, a fiercely loyal and trustworthy friend, wouldn't cause much more risk and certainly would be of great assistance. But Frodo, selflessly, though perhaps imprudently, attempts to avoid dragging even one of his friends into greater danger. Frodo is not just Sam's master, he is Sam's friend. He loves him with the brotherly love that most of us should be so lucky to experience. That is someone worth serving. Sam isn't a poor abused dog beholden to whoever happens to have the other end of his leash. He is a sneakily wise and insightful hobbit who has decided to serve another because his selfless and loving master is deserving of that service. And when we as humans find a cause, big or small, worth serving, we tend to stick to it. Our stories are filled with heroes who demonstrated unfailing perseverance in the face of impossible odds because they believed in their cause, because they loved those behind them or beside them. Sam himself echoes this sentiment in his famous monologue in The Two Towers. Folk in those stories had lots of chances of turning back, only they didn't. That is Sam. Oh, he might not admit it. He certainly would not place himself alongside the people in those stories, but he certainly deserves to be there. When Pippin and Merry tried to use him to spy on Frodo, he could have stayed out of his master's business. When Elrond summoned Frodo to the council, Sam could have explored Rivendell and talked with the elves whom he admires so much. When Frodo chose to go to Mordor alone, Sam could have respected his wishes and stayed with the rest of the Fellowship. But he didn't. There's some good in this world, Mr. Frodo. And it's worth fighting for. Good doesn't need to be an abstract concept or idea. It can be a place or a person. And for Sam, the good that he fights for refusing to turn back time after time, is very much real and tangible. This is why it's so heartbreaking, then, when Sam chooses to abandon Frodo, appearing to be dead from Shelob's sting, 
to continue the quest into Mordor. The mission of the destruction of the ring had always been Frodo's, and Sam's mission had always been Frodo. So when his master is lying still and cold in the tunnels of Kirith Ungol, it is hardly a simple choice for Sam to take the ring and continue onward, leaving Frodo's lifeless body behind, unburied and exposed. That is seemingly the only logical option to continue the quest, but acting rationally or logically in the midst of grief is perhaps too much to expect from even the best of us. Nevertheless, that is what Sam chooses, though he hardly feels confident in that decision. Sam's self-doubt paralyzes him and causes him to hesitate, which is understandable. He set out from the Shire with one goal. Don't you leave him, Samwise Gamgee. And he failed. His failure is lying at his feet. How can he be trusted with an even greater purpose, with the entire weight of the world on his shoulders? Seeing Sam like this can be challenging. He's not acting in the manner of a typical hero, pushing forward no matter the odds or the cost. And that's beautiful. Sam isn't just any hero. His heroism is not defined by his great deeds, but rather by his great love. Abandoning his friend whom he has loved and cared for throughout their arduous journey must be the most difficult decision the young hobbit ever had to make. Again, this plays out differently in the book than in the movie, which doesn't really have time to dwell on Sam's agonized decision. Also not depicted in the film is Sam's struggle with the temptation of the ring. The One Ring does not corrupt by finding the evilest, darkest parts of a person and bringing them to the surface. It corrupts by taking its bearer's most ardent and passionate desires to do good and twisting them in a way that would bring about evil. Sam does not envision himself as a conquering warlord who would replace Sauron and bend all lands to his will, but rather as a gardener, turning the most vile, foul valley on Middle-earth into a beautiful garden. Does it get more Tolkien than that? So how does Sam resist such a potent temptation? No surprise, it was the love of his master that helped most to hold him firm. But not only love for Frodo, Sam's humility also kicks in and reminds him that the one small garden of a free gardener was all his need and due, not a garden swollen to a realm, his own hands to use, not the hands of others to command. As mentioned before, Sam knows his role his abilities, and his needs, and they are all very small. Yes, Sam struggles with self-doubt and self-deprecation, as those vices are on the extreme end of humility, but he still holds fast to the virtue itself, recognizing that it is not his place to be elevated above others, but rather to serve them. This is the reality he has lived his whole life, and especially on this quest, serving and caring for Frodo as they journeyed ever closer to Mordor. And it turns out, Sam can't bring himself to fully abandon Frodo, after all. When the orcs of Mordor discover Frodo's seemingly lifeless body, Sam abandons his role as ringbearer and attempts to return to his master's side, even if it means everything is lost. This poses an interesting question. Should Sam have done this? A reminder that I'm talking about the book, in which Sam is not immediately presented with the fact that Frodo is still alive. Should Sam not have persisted with the quest, taken the ring into Mordor, and attempted, by himself, to cross the plains of Golgoroth, climb Orodruin, and cast the ring into the cracks of doom? Certainly, he should have at least tried, no matter how hopeless it may seem, right? Well, maybe. But it wouldn't really fit his character. Sam has been at Frodo's side throughout the whole journey. How can he leave it at the very end with no hope of seeing Frodo again? That very hope is, after all, what allows Sam to push forward with the ring in the first place. Once the orcs discover Frodo, and that hope is destroyed, Sam naturally reverts to being the loving, devoted servant, which is absolutely essential to his nature. Additionally, Sam fully and truly abandoning Frodo, going off alone, and casting the ring into Mount Doom wouldn't really fit the story's themes either. See, The Lord of the Rings is full of incredibly inspiring characters, absolute paragons of bravery, persistence, and selfless love. But none of them win the day by themselves. They have their victories, to be sure, largely won by joining forces with at least one of the other heroes, but ultimately each and every one of them, from Aragorn to Frodo, finds himself insufficient for achieving total victory over evil. They do great things, but they all fall short. They cooperate with the will of Eru Iluvatar, relying on his providence and acknowledging that they cannot do everything. 
And as Gandalf says in Moria, even the very wise can see all ends. Sam does not know how his story will end, but he knows his place in it. And providentially, that decision turns out to be the best one, as Frodo is very much alive and in need of rescue, and attempting to cross Mordor alone and with an unfamiliar burden would have certainly resulted in Sam being caught. Instead, Sam returns to where he belongs, helping Frodo in any way he can, no matter how dire and impossible their situation may seem. And then, on the slopes of Mount Doom, with all hope having faded away, vanishing like their memories of the Shire and all that is good and beautiful in the world, Sam summons one final feat of filial love. I can't carry it for you, but I can carry you! Come on! Who among you can watch that scene with dry eyes? Is there a more beautiful, inspiring moment in all of film? This incredible display of devotion, dedication, and perseverance from a simple gardener imprints itself on our brains in a way that can hardly be put into words. And that is not because this is a great feat of strength on the part of Sam. Tolkien tells us that Frodo was amazingly light on Sam's shoulders. No, we love this scene. We return to this moment year after year because it is the culmination of Sam's journey. It is the epitome of self-giving love and unwavering faithfulness. It is a depiction of the sort of friendship that we hope and pray to find outside the pages of a book. Sam Gamgee is not your typical hero, and yet he might be the most incredible hero ever created in a work of fiction. If you polled a thousand people from the ages of 10 to 21 and asked them, would you like to be a servant? I'd conjecture that you would receive few, if any, affirmative answers. But if you asked them, would you like to be like Sam Gamgee? You might get a good few nerds who would answer with an enthusiastic yes. And yet, the questions are one and the same. Sam isn't just Frodo's friend and companion. He is those things, to be sure, but also he takes it upon himself to care for Frodo, to watch over the well-being of his master, who bore this unfathomable burden upon an impossible quest. Whether that was carrying more than Sam's fair share of the gear, taking an extra watch at night, or ensuring that Frodo actually remembered to eat, Sam was constantly thinking and acting on Frodo's account, not his own. And this kind of self-gift is so wonderful to see modeled, not only because it provides an example of love to which we can aspire, but also because it is actually attainable. The actions of Sam Gamgee are largely ones we can imitate. I would guess that most of us will never lead men into battle, will never stare the chief servant of the Dark Lord square in his non-face and hold our ground, will never shout before charging at a full gallop into the ranks of our enemy. And yeah, we also probably wouldn't skewer the spawn of a primordial spider being, nor will we firemen's carry anyone up the slopes of a volcano. I mean, probably not, you never know. But we will feed other people. We will clothe them and keep them protected from cold. We will stay awake so they can sleep. We will remain at their side as long as they need us, because how could we do any less? For those whom we love, we give, without thought of remuneration, payment, or any benefit for ourselves. That is what love is, plain and simple. It's willing the good of another for the sake of another, putting their needs before your own. But what about me, asks our culture? What do I get out of this? What is my assured reward for all this self-giving? Well, nothing and everything. What does Frodo do for Sam? Nothing in the material sense. And yet, Frodo gives Sam one of the most sought-for aspects of life. A purpose. Frodo simply is a person worth serving. If the roles were switched, would Frodo not have carried Sam up Mount Doom? Sam certainly would think so. Love is not a business transaction. We do not give it so that we will receive it in return. Yes, we want to receive it, and God willing can surround ourselves with people who love as freely as we do. Love needs to be free to be true. If given under duress or obligation, is it really love? That is why Sam's love for Frodo is so admirable. He could have chosen the easier road, but he didn't. He had chances to turn back, but he didn't. And even if their stories had ended here, here at the end of all things, Sam certainly would not have regretted giving that love so freely. But their stories do not end there. When the ring is destroyed and the Shire restored, 
Sam does in fact reap the fruits of his love. He has a home, a wife, children, a peaceful life, everything he ever wanted. The life he would have had anyway but for the ring, but also one that would have been impossible if not for the choices he made during his journey with Frodo. Sam does not live as a conquering hero, nor attain immeasurable wealth or fame. He is a gardener, surrounded by those whom he loves. Sam left the Shire to save the Shire. He traveled across the world to the end of all things, enduring unspeakable horrors, and his reward is not glory, power, or prestige, but rather the restoration of the simple, peaceful, joyful life he left behind. Okay, wait, hold up. The title of this video is The Masculinity of Sam Gamgee, and yet that was the first time I ever said the word masculinity. What gives? As lots of commenters are fond of pointing out, the virtues that make men such as Aragorn and Iroh so incredible are also virtues that women should strive for. And that is absolutely correct. Masculinity and femininity are not divided by what virtues they have, but rather how they express those virtues. I talked a lot about Sam being a servant, how his love is expressed in serving Frodo, and why that makes him so heroic. Well, guess what? Women serve others too. Could Sam become Samantha? No. At least, not without significant changes to the story. Here's an example of why. Men are natural protectors. It's one of the things we're physically more capable of. Having Frodo watched over and protected by a female hobbit just wouldn't work. Not that she wouldn't be heroic in doing so, but Frodo's character would feel wrong. The natural male instinct to protect the gentler sex would seriously clash with this situation. Frodo would have an innate duty to see to the well-being of the hypothetical Samantha, which he likely couldn't fulfill due to the burden he already carries which would put an extra strain on his character. It's like how my wife has said that she would gladly take a bullet for me. I obviously appreciate that she has that fierce level of love for me and wouldn't want her to feel any other way, but if that actually happened, I couldn't help but think that I failed her, because it's simply my duty as a man to put my body on the line first. Sam being a man allows him to serve and protect Frodo without such dissonance, and this example of masculinity is so necessary in a world in which so many young men are being convinced that the best way to be a man is to dominate others and bend them to your will. Sam's masculinity is simply him, as a man, expressing virtue through his actions, acting in a selfless and loving manner. Men and women can both look at that and ask, how should I emulate this in my own life? Will Sam's example be closer to the male experience? Yes. Does that mean it is exclusive to men? Of course not. Just like how Eowyn's bravery and love for Theoden and her country are certainly inspiring for women and men, but Eowyn's femininity is absolutely crucial to her character. Ultimately, her heroes are great men and women because they are great people. Their masculinity and femininity are the products of acting in virtuous ways. Are men and women interchangeable? No, of course not. But we can learn how to be better men by examining great examples of femininity, and better women by learning from men who display authentic masculinity. Male or female, if we strive to emulate Sam Gamgee's example of bravery, loyalty, perseverance, and selfless love, we cannot fail to become better people. And that's what this is about. Stories, even fantasy, or maybe especially fantasy, are meant to change us, to make us desire to become more than we are. We need stories like The Lord of the Rings to show us the heights to which we can aspire, and in characters like Sam, we can see how even the simplest and most ordinary among us has the potential for greatness. I'm back.